Hello and welcome. This is Greg Owen, the CEO of the GoCo Group. We're so excited and thrilled to have with us today our special guest, Jim Rickard. Well, Jim, what we're going to be doing in the program this morning will be we're going to have you do a presentation for about 45 minutes. And then at the end, uh, we're going to have a, a Q&A uh, with you. And so I'm asking everybody, please send through your questions. And uh, I always love having a q and I've had one with you um, uh, once before, Jim, and it's always fantastic. And I look forward to doing it again. So Jim, over to you. Thanks, Greg. And it's great to be with you and uh, great to be with your audience. Uh, looking forward to this. Um, I'm going to break my presentation into kind of a part one and part two, uh, and then we'll get to the Q&A. Uh, in part one, I'll do uh, uh, some uh, uh, an overview of the Australian economy. I know we have an Australian host, an Australian audience. We have people perhaps from all over the world, but a lot of focus in Australia. We'll talk about that. Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, the pandemic. That's something that is, is global. That's what a pandemic is. Uh, no one is unaffected by it, so uh, we, we probably all... Uh, know too much about it, but a little bit of a description of that and the impact on the economy, which is really our focus. Um, then I'm gonna talk about what I call the global depression. And that's the title of my new book, The New Great Depression. Uh, uh, again, something that affects everyone as part of the economic fallout of the pandemic. I'm gonna focus on uh, the United States, uh, not just because I'm an American, but because uh, it's the largest economy in the world. So whatever happens in the US, has ripple effects around the world, including Australia and China and um, uh, Asia. So, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll drill down on that, do a forecast. Then we're gonna talk about um, what investors can do uh, broadly in terms of asset allocation investments that will see them through what is obviously a very uncertain period. Uh, so that's part one. Part two, um, we're gonna talk about the future of money and kind of four topics that everyone has some interest in. Uh, gold, certainly, uh, Bitcoin, I, we've got some great, uh, Speakers, Greg has some great speakers lined up specifically on Bitcoin, but I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Maybe say a few things that you, you've never heard before, a, a different way of looking at it, put it that way. Um, the new kid on the block, central bank digital currencies. Uh, and then finally, our old friend SDRs, uh, special drawing rights SDRs, which is kind of world money from the IMF. So that's a quick overview. And then uh, back, to, back to Greg for, uh, uh, for some questions. If I don't get to a topic, never fear, because we'll probably covered in the questions. So let's start with Australia. I mean, what can you say? The Australian economy is very strong. Uh, they don't call Australia the, luck, the lucky country for nothing. Uh, right now, your interest rates are low. You've got an easy money policy uh, from the Reserve Bank of Australia. You've had a smooth transition from the JobKeeper program. There was a lot of concern that when that uh, benefit ended, that perhaps um, you know, people wouldn't be able to get jobs and consumption would dry up. That has not happened. Uh, the, uh, the job market is strong, and so the job keeper kind of did its job, uh, has gone away, which is good from a fiscal point of view, but um, that was not disruptive. Uh, Australian retail sales were down a little bit in the last month, but still positive, and they're expected to grow as your vaccination program spreads. So Australia got off to a little bit of a slow start, but catching up fast. So again, that's moving the country towards... Uh, what uh, epidemiologists call herd immunity. And uh, we're not at the end of the pandemic, but uh, certainly uh, I would say the end is in sight and Australia is making good progress there. A um, Couple other points that are important to bear in mind. <clears throat> Australia has one of the lower debt to GDP ratios of any developed economy, meaning your national debt divided by your GDP, uh, and that's a percentage. Uh, the US is sky high, I'll talk uh, more about the US. But Australia is, a, is, is in a very good position. It has a sustainable debt to GDP ratio. What that means is if you need fiscal policy help, you can get it. You have headroom to, um, to run larger deficits and expand fiscal stimulus. I'm not saying that Australia will need it. What I'm saying is if you need it, you've got the headroom and you can do it without some of the negative consequences that we are seeing in the United States. So that's a, another plus. Um, inflation's low which means if you need monetary stimulus, you can get it. Again, inflation's running out of control. Central banks have to rein it in. They can't provide easy money forever. They can do it for short periods of time. But uh, if, if inflation is uh, uh, on, the, uh, <clears throat> on the horizon, you might have to rein in your monetary policy. Again, that's not the case in Australia. Inflation is very uh, well behaved and you have room for monetary stimulus if you need it. Um, despite uh, the kind of de facto trade war between China and Australia, China's acting like a bully, cutting off certain imports from Australia, most famously wine. 
But the fact is, uh, Australia has what China desperately needs, coal and iron ore. So, okay, maybe you're not selling as much wine to China, but uh, coal and iron ore uh, exports from Australia to China are running close to all-time highs. China is uh, stimulating its economy the way they always do, which is with debt and construction. Uh, they're very good at building things that whether they need everything they're building, whether they're wasting uh, uh, that debt on white elephant projects or uh, you know train stations with 128 escalators that are mostly empty, uh, who knows, but, uh, but they're doing it. That's how they drive ahead because they don't really have a consumption driven economy. They have to have an investment driven economy and uh, the investments wasted, that's a problem for another day. But in the meantime, keep the steel mills uh, going, keep the electric uh, generators running and they do that with coal and, and iron ore from Australia. So that's it's another strength. So on the whole, you know, strong growth, uh, growth should continue. Your, your the central bank has said they're gonna continue the QE for a while longer. They haven't set a, a, a deadline when they'll cut it off, so-called tapering, but uh, at least through September, possibly later, you've got room for larger deficits and you're going to have some tax relief. So um, I, I don't like to sound like Pollyanna. If, uh, if I see problems, I'm the first one to, to call them out. Uh, but uh, Australia just is kind of hitting on all cylinders right now. Strong comeback from the pandemic, um, strong recovery uh, and room to grow, room to take this further, both in terms of fiscal and monetary policy. So sort of all good on Australia. There are three vulnerabilities. I think, again, I don't want to suggest that there's there, nothing could go wrong, but there are three things that could go wrong that Australians need to bear in mind despite all the good news. The first one, and this is critical, is a slowdown in China uh, because Australia is so dependent on exports to China. If China slows down, Australia slows down. It's as simple as that. For the time being, um, we're coming up July 1st on the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party of China. That's a very big deal, you know, centenary. centenary um, uh, <clears throat> the, the China's determined that nothing can go wrong between now and July 1st. So nothing will be allowed to go wrong. So I would expect for the next few months, at least everything will continue. But after July 1st, um, they're gonna have to face up to some of these problems, including uh, perhaps a new housing bubble, over leverage, bad debt, um, wasted investment. They don't wanna do anything right now. But later this summer and certainly later this year, um, you might see the Chinese economy slow down. That could be a little bit of a headwind for Australia. A bigger headwind, which, I, which I'll talk more about in a minute in a lot more detail, is a U.S. slowdown. Um, it's not so much that uh, um, Australia exports a lot to the United States. There are some exports, of course, but it's kind of a triangular trade. Australia exports raw materials to China. China does the manufacturing and the U.S consumer buy the Chinese manufactured goods. Well, if the US slows down and we buy less from China, China's gonna need less from Australia. So it's a, you know, it's a kind of a bank shot if, uh, if you wanna think of a, a billiard table, but, um, uh, but, but Australia is indirectly vulnerable to a slowdown in the US because if we slow down, China slows down and then that affects Australia. So, um, and the third thing I would look out for asset bubbles. Good news is good news, uh, that's, uh, that's fine. But if uh, housing gets too hot, if the stock market gets too hot, those things have a way of correcting. So, um, you know, again, applaud the good economy, uh, good um, fiscal monetary policy, uh, uh, you know, whether the, the Chinese bullying uh, in, in good form. So a lot going on in Australia that's very positive, but uh, watch out for asset bubbles, uh, particularly, uh, and again, I'll talk more about this. If the U.S. is in, if the U.S. stock markets are in a bubble, which they are, and I'll be specific about that, uh, and there's a severe correction later this year, which I expect, then that could affect Australia as well. So right now, fundamentally, all good on the Australian economy. Uh, exports booming to China, despite the uh, bullying by China. Um, uh, jobs are plentiful. Housing prices are going up. You have room in fiscal monetary policy, but Watch out for uh, a Chinese slowdown later this year, a U.S. slowdown later this year, and maybe some severe corrections in our stock market that, that could have a ripple effect in Australia. Let me switch now to the pandemic. Uh, of course, that's the, uh, the biggest story in the world for the last two years. Uh, things are definitely improving. It's not over, but it's getting much better. Uh, case loads and certainly fatalities are dropping precipitously in the U.S. and Australia. Um, this fourth wave, which we saw in, in the U.S., is abating very quickly. Um, there is a world 
Uh, the world numbers are, are sort of uh, three waves, an initial wave last spring, a, a strong wave last winter, and then a new wave right now, which is uh, uh, the worst of the three, primarily driven by caseloads in, in, sorry, in uh, Brazil and India. Um, but that is tailing off. Um, interestingly, I, I, you know, when I wrote my book, The New Great Depression, it was kind of half economics, half um, uh, the pandemic, epidemiology, and vir virology. And so I, I did a uh, a deep dive on the science here. And uh, one of the most interesting things I discovered is that these waves take about eight to 10 weeks. They're very predictable. Hard to predict exactly when, when and where they're gonna break out, but when they do, you can predict a downslope after about eight weeks. And that seems to be playing out. That's one of that's something that the, the virologists don't talk about because it's math and statistics, but the uh, applied mathematicians have sorted it out from data. Uh, and so, uh, even on that basis, we're seeing uh, a lot more uh, a lot more good news, despite some of the problems in India and Brazil. Um, vaccine rollout is irregular around the world. Australia was a little bit slow. Uh, some countries, uh, the UAE, actually, Israel, and some others have done a great job. The U.S. has done a pretty good job. Europe, not so much. Uh, it's uneven, but it is happening. And um, even the people who got off to a slow start are catching up. Uh, herd immunity is gaining. Herd immunity comes not just from vaccinations, but also from survivors. If you, if you had COVID and you survived, you've got better antibodies than people getting the vaccines. So the combination of the two, the survivors and, the, and those who are vaccinated, uh, give the virus fewer places to go. Viruses hop around from host to host, which in, in this case is human to human. But if every, every time they, the virus hops, it encounters someone who has the antibodies either from uh, having had it already or from the vaccine, then eventually the virus dies out. That's how these things fade. That is happening. Um, there is, um, again, got to be very alert to what's called mutational escape, where the virus mutates in such a way that it evades the impact of the new vaccines. That is not the case so far. Let's hope that continues to be true, but another thing to uh, keep an eye on. Um, most of the economic damage is really from bad public policy. Lockdowns don't work. I know you have a severe lockdown in Victoria. Um, uh, a lot of people applaud that, but the fact is there have been studies from uh, using, using the United States as an example. There was never a national lockdown in the United States. We have 50 states. So we have 50 state lockdowns imposed by governors and mayors uh, of varying degrees. Uh, California and New York were extreme, uh, probably a lot like Victoria. Uh, Melbourne, um, uh, Florida was uh, moderate. Uh, some states like South Dakota never had a lockdown. They just, it was completely voluntary, you know, just kind of use common sense. Same thing around the world. Um, Italy, uh, France, and Spain, among others, had extreme lockdowns. Uh, Sweden had a moderate lockdown. Other countries, Brazil, at least initially, did very little. Uh, but, but at this point, a year on, we, we, we've been able to get the data. So you can do scientific studies. You don't have to guess or you don't have to politicize it. And the studies show clearly there is no correlation between lockdowns and uh, caseloads. No correlation between lock the type of lockdown you had and how quickly the virus spreads. In other words, lockdowns don't work. Politicians do them anyway because uh, they have to be seen to be doing something, but they don't seem to be uh, reading much science as far as that's concerned. So, uh, so the economic damage in Australia and around the world was done by the lockdowns, but lockdowns didn't really do any good. But the good news is the virus is fading on its own. Um, you know, some things make sense. Hand washing obviously is a, a plus. So we're, we're seeing the pandemic fade. It's fading faster in Australia um, and the United States, uh, more slowly in, uh, in Japan uh, and, and some other countries um, and uh, still a serious problem in Brazil and India. So we're not out of the woods yet, but things are getting much better. So it will have less of an economic impact going forward, although I would drop a footnote there and say that what we're dealing with now are the, is the aftermath of the, the mental health problems, the uh, adjustments people are having. You know, you, 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 governments made people live in fear for a year and everyone was wearing masks. Um, now that I mean, there's, there's zero cases have been discovered of a viral spread out, outdoors. This thing just doesn't spread uh, outdoors, if, uh, it, but there's no reason to wear a mask out, outdoors. Uh, but uh, people do it anyway because they, they adapted to the mask and now they can't take it off. So we're seeing the, the residual fear, which is um, a continued headwind for growth. So uh, you can put it in the mental health category rather than the 
epidemiological category, but it's real. And uh, again, that's going to uh, slow growth around the world relative to what it would be otherwise. Um, so uh, with that kind of as, as a backdrop, again, news is getting better, not quite out of the woods, uh, but there'll be less of a factor going forward. But don't underestimate the adaptive behavior that has occurred and that will, will continue uh, to slow growth. Let me pivot now to what I call the, uh, the new Great Depression or the Global Depression. Here, there's a lot of confusion over definitions. Um, people are familiar with the definition of a recession, uh, the R word, recession. Uh, it's generally defined as two, two or more consecutive quarters of declining GDP. A couple other bells and whistles, but that's basically the definition. Australia got through their first recession in, I think, 26 years, maybe 27 years, uh, um, but uh, I think the longest uh, on record for a developed economy. Um, the U.S. Um, got through a severe recession in 2008-2009 uh, and had another, well, the most severe since the end of World War II in uh, 2020. Um, but, um, but that's over. There is growth. Uh, growth rates vary, but uh, there is growth around the world. Um, at least, well, sorry, at least in the United States, North America, generally Australia and, uh, and China. Um, uh, Europe is in a back-to-back -back recession. They had a recession in early 2020, a, a recovery in late 2020, and a new recession now. So uh, Australia's back in recession. So that's the definition of a recession. So people have an, uh, an intuition that, well, depression sounds worse than recession. So if a recession is two quarters of declining GDP, two or more, a depression must be 10 quarters of declining GDP. It must be some really horrible thing. And depressions are bad, but that's not the definition of a depression. You can have growth in a depression. It's just that the growth is below trend. It's below potential. And so it's depressed growth. Uh, this is true in the United States during the, the first Great Depression from 1929 to 1940. Uh, 1929 to 1933 was a flat out uh, depression down the whole four years. Uh, but the Great Depression is conventionally dated from 1929 to 1940. But in the middle of that, 1933 to 1936, the US had pretty good growth. The problem was it, it had fallen so much prior to 1932, it was growing, but it was in a very deep hole. It never got back to the pre-1929 levels. The stock markets never got back to those levels until 1954. Commercial real estate never recovered the pre-1929 level until 1954. It took 25 years to dig out of the hole. So even though you have growth in a depression, it's depressed growth relative to trend. You still haven't recovered your losses. To, today, the U.S. has not regained the 2019 levels of output. Uh, yeah, we had growth in 2020, a pretty good growth in the third quarter, a growth in the first quarter of 2021. But we're still not back to where we were in 2019. Um, so that, that's a depression. That's going to continue for a long time. We, we will have growth. We do have growth. But it'll be quite low relative to uh, long-term trends and will not get us back to where we were for a, a considerable period of time. So that's what we mean by a depression. And you have to look at not just lost output and growth. Um, you have to look at lost wealth. Uh, people say, oh, look, you know, we're having a reopening. Restaurants are reopening. Well, yes, a lot of restaurants are reopening if you survive. But a lot of restaurants didn't. They're closed permanently. They broke the leases. They fired the employees. They, the equipment's up for sale, 10 cents on the dollar. In other words, um, you may get output. You may get GDP back uh, with these gradual reopenings. But uh, where's the compensation for the lost wealth? And that uh, that is another problem, and um, uh, again, it's uh, it's a major setback, and it's why we're, uh, why we're in a depression. There is no pent-up demand. That's nonsense. You hear a lot about it. Oh, the economy will come roaring back because of pent-up demand. Um, no, um, the example I give, and there are many examples, but you know, during the 2020 quarantine, uh, we were locked down for about 14 weeks. Uh, you know, my wife and I like to go out to dinner on a Friday night. Well, for 14 weeks, we didn't go out to dinner, first of all, because the restaurants were closed, and secondly, because everyone was, was pretty much locked down in their homes. Well, by last summer, uh, restaurants reopened. We went out to dinner, but we didn't order 14 dinners. We ordered one the way we usually do. In other words, okay, we were back out. The restaurant was getting some revenue, and we were having dinner, but that those 14 dinners we skipped were permanently lost. There's no 
pent up demand for those lost dinners uh, or any think of anything else uh, you know shopping groceries dinners uh, um, you know movies uh, shows uh, vacations it's just lost um, so there is no pent up demand there is no v-shaped recovery the, the notion of the v was that it would go down sharply and come back sharply didn't happen what happened was it went down sharply and it came back but then it truncated right now we're leveling out so we have sort of a a half a B on the upside, but not a full B. We're not back to where we were. And, and that strong growth, relatively strong growth coming out of the bottom of the recession from 2020, which persisted pretty much through the third quarter, and then it petered off, uh, petered out again. Um, that is now flattening. Uh, so are we in a second technical recession? No, but we're not growing anywhere near what we need to, to regain the loss growth in, in many measures. And so uh, we're back to kind of that weak growth, which we had from 2009 to 2019. We had 10 years of, of depressed growth uh, following the last, following the global financial crisis. And we're, we're kind of getting back to that again. So don't, uh, don't buy into the story of, you know, we're, we're in a super boom or super growth period. We're growing, yes, but it, it, it's quite weak. And so um, um, I, I would also emphasize, um, again, I talked a little bit about the mental health aspects. We don't have to call it mental health, it's called behavioral adaptation. It takes a lot to get people to change. And the pandemic is a big deal. Worst pandemic in hundred years, third worst pandemic uh, in 650 years, going back to the Black Death and then the Spanish flu and now um, uh, the COVID-19. Um, so people changed their behavior. They stayed home, they became fearful, they put on masks, they closed businesses, et cetera. Well, now uh, everyone's saying, well, you know, the virus is under control, vaccine, vaccines are spreading, herd immunity is building up. You can't get it outside. After all, the six foot social distancing was a joke. After all, uh, now they tell us, uh, but by the way, the six foot distancing it came from a 19th century German scientist who was working on a different pandemic and said it was a guess. And there was, there was no real science behind it. And uh, he was candid about saying it was a guess. Somehow that became the law of the land. But uh, there's nothing to it. These things didn't work. They didn't help, but they did um, destroy social interaction and destroy the economy. Um, well, now a lot of that is going away, but the behavior is the same. And this is this is my point. It's not like throwing a light switch where, oh, we'll just be the way we were in the summer of 2019. No, these effects will be intergenerational. These effects will not will linger. They will not go away easily. Um, I mean, there's always a place for anecdotal evidence. I was shopping the other day. It was minding my own business, uh, looking at light bulbs and uh, overheard a conversation with one of the customers and, and the clerk at the counter. And he was saying, uh, you know, I hear the bars are reopening, but uh, I'm not going, you know, if you're, that's all you have, uh, if that's your entertainment, fine, but I'm not going. I probably won't be in a bar for another year. And I'm, I'm wearing my mask. I don't care what anybody says. Well, those are choices. I'm not, I didn't say a word and I'm not going to, and I'm not here to tell other people what to do I and mean, let everyone make their own decisions. But I found it fascinating as an anecdote that there was no science, no uh, necessity behind what the guy was saying. But he he had he was demonstrating the fact that he can't go back to the way he was. He can't uh, suddenly spend money at the bar or restaurant or movie theater or any place else for that matter. Uh, and that he expected he wouldn't change his behavior for a year. Well, you know what? He might not change his behavior for five years or ten years. These effects are intergenerational. The, the effects of the Great Depression of the 1930s did not wear off until the late 1960s. It was the baby boom when they came of age in the late 60s. Then it was, you know, credit cards and debt and leverage and, uh, and rock and roll. But, um, but behavior in the 50s, 1950s and 1960s, early 1960s, was still prudent, still low consumption, still savings driven, still um, demonstrating the behavior that had been learned, the adaptive behavior that had that had emerged during the Great Depression. So don't underestimate the extent to which these effects linger for a very long period of time. Um, so uh, uh, we've had this change in psychology. So th th this global depression defined as below trend growth in Australia, in the United States, despite a, a bounce back and Europe and elsewhere, uh, is, uh, is going to be with us for a long time. So it doesn't mean there won't be any growth. It'll be a lot less than people think. It won't support the kind of stock market valuations we're seeing. Uh, and a lot of it is behavioral. You won't be able to change it with fiscal and monetary policy. It'll take, as I say, uh, the, the better part of a generation and, and, a, and a younger generation, maybe generation uh, 
uh, Z, I guess they call them, to, um, uh, to really come into their own and change things again. This happened in the late 1960s. Um, let me pivot now to the U.S. economy, in, in, uh, in particular, the, the largest economy in the world. I mentioned the lingering effects of pan pandemic behavioral adaptations as reasons why the U.S. economy will, will not uh, come back as strongly as a lot of people expect, why it will underperform. But there's a long, there's a long list of additional reasons. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Um, one of them is uh, the policies. Pardon me, the policies of, of the Biden administration there. I don't want to debate the policies. There are two sides, but I will just tell you, economically, they're all bad. Um, they want higher taxes. They're shutting down energy. They're shutting down uh, oil and natural gas drilling on federal lands, uh, new permits. They shut down the um, XL pipeline. Um, borders are wide open, which means wages will be held down. Again, I don't want to debate border policy. I'm just telling you right now, we don't have a border policy. The border is open. Uh, millions are streaming in and, and uh, whatever the minimum wage is, they don't care. They're here illegally. Why would they care about working for $3 an hour? They will. Uh, and that drags down wages for everybody. If you're uh, a legal citizen and you're entitled to a minimum wage, <coughs> pardon me, you might, you still can't get the job because you're competing with the illegal who's working for half the minimum wage. So uh, again, uh, whatever you think of open borders, that's one of the economic consequences. Uh, so these are all slow growth policies, job killing policies. One of the uh, curious things that in the United States right now is uh, employers can't find workers. Uh, they're reopening, you know, the movie theaters, the bars, the restaurants, the salons, the boutique shopping, they're all reopening. They can't find anyone to hire. They're, they're, they're major um, uh, shortages in terms of uh, the ability to hire. At the same time, we have um, 10 million Americans between the ages of 25 and 54 who are, uh, uh, who are not working, uh, technically not unemployed because they're not looking for jobs, but they are de facto unemployed because they don't have jobs. And many, many millions more who are collecting unemployment benefits. And that's the problem. We increased our unemployment benefits. We extended them and raised them um, over $300 a week. Uh, so you can make thirty-five, even forty thousand dollars a year in unemployment benefits, childcare tax credits, etc., uh, earned income credits. Um, and if you have a thirty-five thousand dollar a year job, even if you have a forty-five thousand dollar a year job, would you rather sit home and do nothing and collect forty thousand dollars in government benefits, or go back to work and maybe make forty-five thousand dollars and pay more taxes and uh, you know further ahead? Well, a lot of people are sensible. Well, Sensibly or not, a lot of people are choosing to sit home and collect the checks. Um, so we have relatively high unemployment, a low labor force participation, tens of millions of Americans not working who, who could be, and yet employers can't find workers, but that's because we're paying them to stay home. So that's another, uh, that's gonna result in higher wages, at least for, uh, for a lot of employers and, um, and slower growth in the economy. Um, so these are all policy issues where they, they've got the policies wrong. There are new policies coming along later this year that are going to continue this uh, slow growth uh, scenario that I described. Um, what about stimulus? What about monetary stimulus? The Federal Reserve has printed uh, over $4 trillion of base money. Uh, and our, that's M0, so-called, and uh, our M1 um, numbers are going up even more. Uh, people go, well, look at all those trillions of dollars the Fed is printing. We're going to get inflation. Uh, no, we're not. Um, not anytime soon. Money printing does not cause inflation. Um, the, the Austrian school says it does. Um, a lot of the libertarians say it does. It doesn't. Um, we've had, we had money printing with QE 1, 2, 3, and 4 from 2009 to 2019. We never got serious inflation, and we're not getting it now. Um, Money printing does not cause inflation. What does cause inflation is velocity. That's the turnover of money. Um, an example I've given uh, before, you know, I go out to dinner and I tip the waiter and the waiter takes a taxi home and tips the taxi driver and the taxi driver takes the tip money and puts gas in her car. Well, in that example, my dollar has a velocity of three. It's supported, one dollar supported three dollars of goods and services. The, the waiter tip, the um, taxi tip, and the gasoline. But what if I stay home and watch TV? Well, now my money has velocity of zero. My money's still in the bank. I didn't spend it. 
Uh, and I remind people that $7 trillion times zero is zero. That's the quantity theory of money. In other words, it doesn't matter how much money you have. If you have low velocity, you're not going to get nominal GDP. You're not going to get the growth. Um, and just to, to give uh, an example, in um, uh, the fourth quarter of 2007, velocity was 10.7%. Uh, it means every dollar supported $10 uh, of goods and services. Today, it's around 3.5%. Uh, meaning a dollar only supports $3 of goods and services. Velocity has plunged. In the first half, if you look at the chart, in the first half of 2020, it looked like a, an Acapulco cliff dot. It went straight down. Uh, someone said, asked me the other day, how low can velocity go? I said, well, technically it can go to zero. I don't, I don't think it will, but even if it goes from three to two, that's a one third decline in nominal GDP, all things equal. So, um, so the Fed has to print money just to keep the economy from collapsing, but, but, but you're not getting inflation. You're getting zero interest rates. And uh, people said U.S. interest rates have gone up recently. They're referring to the yield of maturity on the 10-year Treasury note. That's not a short-term rate. That's an intermediate term rate uh, or even a long-term rate. Uh, but um, uh, okay, it's 1.6%. Well, a few years ago, it was over 3%. So it has gone up from 60 basis points to 160 basis points but it's still lower than it was during the last spike. It's a pattern of lower highs and lower lows. The trend is still, uh, still down. So interest rates are dropping. Fiscal policy has no stimulative impact. And people say, well, how can that be? You had a you know, trillion dollar baseline budget deficits in fiscal 2020, fiscal 2021. Donald Trump put on $3 trillion of additional deficit spending on top of that. President Biden so far has put on $2 trillion of additional spending. So that's five plus two, so that's $7 trillion of deficit. And the Biden administration is planning seven, or sorry, $4 trillion more later this year, which they're going to get um, probably before September. Um, so that's eight, uh, sorry, that's $9 trillion of deficit spending. Uh, when going into this, the national debt after 230 years was only $22 trillion. So you just put $9 trillion of deficit on top of $22 trillion. It took, again, 230 years to get to 22, but we got to 31 real fast, just in two years. Well, doesn't that mean the economy is booming? Again, the answer is no. And the reason in the United States, this is not true in Australia, by the way, but it is true in the United States. Our debt to GDP ratio is 130%. That's one of the worst in the world. If you said, well, who else is kind of close to that? The answer is uh, uh, Italy, uh, Lebanon, and Greece. There's your lunch table. Is that, is that the group you, you, know, you want to be uh, uh, compared to? Uh, even uh, countries in Europe that are more, uh, that are, you know, more socialist, so socialist sorry, than the United States that the Americans like to make fun of in terms of fiscal irresponsibility are better than we are. Spain is about 90%. Spain, France, uh, uh, are, are well below 100%. Germany is even lower, close to 60%. The U.S. is 130%. Um, and so what happens is, and the research on this is very clear, when you go past 90%, when your national debt is more than 90% of your GDP, your so-called Keynesian multiplier, fiscal multiplier, drops below one. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that at lower levels of debt, so you know, Australia would be a good example of you have 30 or 40% debt to GDP ratio. If the government borrows a dollar and spends a dollar, you can get more than a dollar of GDP. You can borrow a dollar, spend a dollar, and you can get a dollar 25 of GDP. So that, that's the stimulus that, that has some stimulus, stimulative effect. Whether that's temporary or permanent or just bringing demand forward, that's a separate debate, but it does work that way. Borrow a dollar, spend a dollar, get a dollar twenty-five of GDP. But above ninety percent, uh, you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, and you get less than a dollar of GDP. You might only get ninety cents or eighty cents or even less. That's where the United States is now. But the result of that, and again, this is simple math, is if you're uh, increasing your debt by a dollar, but you're only increasing your GDP by say eighty cents, what's happening to the debt to GDP ratio? It's going up. In other words, there's more debt being piled on top of a given amount of GDP. The ratio is going up. Well, the ratio is the problem in the first place once it's over 90%. Now you're making it worse because you're still borrowing spending, but you're not getting the GDP to support to, to go along with that. 
your Keynes and multipliers less than one. So you're just digging a deeper hole. That's why you can't borrow your way out of the debt crisis. So monetary policy in the US won't work because of velocity. Fiscal policy won't work because the debt to GDP ratio is too high. And, and this is behavioral adaptation. People look at that. You don't need a PhD in economics. You just say to yourself, hey, I, I don't know how this is going to end, but they're either going to have inflation or they're going to raise my taxes. The third way out is default. The US doesn't have to default because we can print the money, um, at least for now. But, uh, um, but people say there's going to be inflation or taxes. They're both bad outcomes. So people save more. It's called precautionary savings. And guess what happens when you save? You're not spending. So that affects consumption. And that's another reason that the economy is uh, slowing down. So, um, so the US forecast, I, would, I wouldn't, ex I'm not forecasting a second recession, but I do forecast a continuation of a depression, much slower growth than expected for the reasons I mentioned. Um, and uh, let me just kind of uh, recap a little bit and go through some, uh, some recommendations for investors. Uh, um, I recommend a, a decent sized allocation to cash, perhaps as much as 30% of your portfolio. And people go, well, wait a second, you know, cash has no yield or practically no yield. Uh, you know, what good is it? I want, I want stocks or I want things that are going up. Well, okay, but uh, cash has a lot of hidden benefits that people underestimate. One is that, uh, first of all, it reduces the overall volatility of your portfolio. So if you have volatile assets over here, like gold or real estate and other volatile assets like stocks and bonds, a slice of cash in the middle will reduce the overall volatility. So maybe you can sleep a little better at night. People worry about inflation, fine, but I would suggest that deflation may be a real problem, at least for the next year or two. And cash uh, can be your best performing asset in deflation because the real value of cash goes up. But most importantly, cash gives you optionality. Obviously, based on what I've said, there's a lot of uncertainty, pandemic uncertainty, policy uncertainty, economic uncertainty. Um, if you're the one with cash, uh, you can pivot as visibility improves. In other words, if you're all in stocks and the stock market crashes, uh, but you've got cash, you can go shopping in the wreckage. You can be the ones who, who picks up the bargains or uh, if some other asset class collapses, again, the person with cash can buy the, first of all, doesn't lose because cash won't lose value. doesn't gain a lot of value except in deflation, but it won't lose value. But if something else does, you can come along and, and, and shop for the bargain. So that's a, that optionality, that embedded optionality is a very valuable aspect of cash. Um, residential real estate should do well, it should outperform. Not for good reasons, by the way, it's because people are leaving the cities. They, um, the, the pandemic has taken, uh, what, what it's left cities with all of the detriments, which are you know, crowds, noise, you know, pollution, uh, crime, et cetera but none of the benefits. The culture's gone, the museums are closed, the theaters are closed, uh, restaurants are closed. Okay, they're starting to reopen. Life is coming back a little bit, but um, cities have been pretty dismal places to be and the population density is high, which there's still the residual fear of uh, the pandemic. So people are just leaving the cities and going to the suburbs or even going to the country. And that is what's driving, part of what's driving this residential real estate boom. So residential real estate is, is an attractive asset. Commercial real estate is not off the bottom. Uh, it's too soon to jump in, uh, partly because of the work from home phenomena, uh, partly because depending on the market, social unrest. Um, and so, uh, um, and, and a lot of tenants are out of business who so can't pay the rent. So uh, commercial real estate is something you might look at in late 2022 or early 2023, too, uh, too soon to jump in. I recommend a 10% allocation to gold, uh, physical bullion, keep it a safe place. Um, it's obviously it's protection against uh, uh, inflation, but gold actually does very well in deflation during the Great Depression, longest sustained period of deflation in US history. Gold went up 75% from $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce. So um, people kind of get the fact that gold does well in inflation, but they are not as well acquainted with the fact that gold does well in deflation also, particularly in the period of low interest rates when you know, gold is competing with notes for investor dollars. Low interest rates make gold uh, relatively more attractive. Um, high quality government notes, Australian government bonds, US treasuries, uh, will continue to do well. Interest rates have not hit bottom. They're low, but they can go lower and they will. Um, equities uh, have um, a very strong bubble characteristics right now. Now, the problem with bubbles is uh, they can get bubble, more bubbly. Uh, uh, you can't just look at a bubble and short it. I don't recommend that. 
Uh, but you can be pretty sure the bubble will burst at some point, perhaps sooner or later, but not right away. The bubble can continue for a while. I mean, just looking at the U.S. equity markets, uh, there's something called the uh, the CAPE ratio, uh, invented by uh, Nobel Prize winning economist Robert Schiller and a collaborator. Um, it's basically a P.E. ratio, price to earnings ratio, and you're all familiar with that. But Schiller does two things. Number one, he takes the 10-year average of the price to earnings ratio. And the purpose of that is P.E. ratios kind of go up during a boom and down during a recession. And his view is take a 10-year average and that will factor out the business cycle and give you more of a pure play on the business itself and the economy itself. And he adjusts them for inflation so you can compare the older data and the newer data. It's, it's apples to apples. Um, that CAPE ratio today is at the second highest level in history. Um, the only time it was higher, the CAPE ratio basically means the other the, the, the price of the stock relative to the earnings. For a given amount of earnings, what multiple can do you apply to get to the level of the stock market? That's, uh, but again, with these adjustments, they call it the CAPE ratio. Um, cycle readjusted price earnings. It's at the second highest level in history. The only time it was higher was before the dot-com crash, but you remember the dot-com crash? Our US NASDAQ fell over 70% in a couple of years. Um, it's right now it's higher than it was on October 19, 1987 when the stock market fell 22% in one day. It's higher than it was on Black Tuesday in October 1929 when the stock market crashed and began the Great Depression. So I'm not saying it won't go higher. I'm not saying it's over. I, I am saying that that is a nosebleed level and uh, no one should be surprised at the stock market crash tomorrow. Uh, if you just take a straight uh, price earnings ratio, not the cycle we adjusted one that Schiller does, just the S&P 500 price earnings ratio. Uh, right now, again, second highest level in history, higher than immediately before the Great Depression, higher than the uh, than the dot com, uh, three times the long term mean, uh, three times the long term median, um, higher than during the Roaring Twenties. The only time it was higher was right after the global financial crisis, right around May 2009, when prices had taken off um, because we were kind of coming out of a bad a recession, but uh, earnings had not caught up. Uh, at that point, it, it got crazy. It was over 120 to, uh, to one, but uh, right now it's 44 to one. And uh, again, that's the second highest in history other than that one very brief anomaly. Uh, dividends are the second lowest dividends to, uh, Stock prices are the second lowest level in history. So um, uh, by every measure, uh, historically, recently, low dividend earnings, high uh, PE ratios, high cyclically adjusted PE ratios, and other metrics, the, the US stock market is in a bubble. It's very clear. Um, but when will it burst? Well, it's hard to say, but the, the like, most likely scenario, so you have a narrative. So what's the narrative? Um, you know, the, there is no alternative to stocks. You know, bonds are low. Gold has been kind of going sideways. Um, you know, real commercial real estate suffering. European Europe's in recession, etc. Uh, so Tina, you know, there is no T I N A. There is no alternative. Uh, that's one narrative. A fear of missing out. FOMO, F L M O. Fear of missing out. Who wants to go to a cocktail party and have, or the club and have all your friends tell you how much money they're making in the stock market and you're not invested in stocks? So the the social pressure to jump on the bandwagon is extremely high. The economic myths I busted earlier, you know, the reshape recovery, not true, but people believe it. Um, you know, pent up demand, not true, but people believe it, uh, et cetera. So there are these belief systems, these narratives, which are very powerful, which are driving the stock market higher. Plus the idea that you can't beat the market, which is not true, but a lot of people believe that also leads you to passive investing, index funds, ETFs, et cetera. What happens when money goes into an index fund? Well, they buy stocks. And what happens is the stock price goes up. Some more money comes in. They buy more stocks and the price goes up. So you have a recursive function, a feedback loop of money coming in and prices going up. Um, and it works, but uh, until it goes backwards and then it drops really fast. So the, the way I think about it, that we have a narrative driving the stock market higher. Uh, earnings don't support it. Fundamental economic growth does not support it. The narratives do. So when will the narratives change? Um, and my expectation is by late this year, perhaps November, uh, we'll have second quarter data, we'll have third quarter data. We'll begin to see that the economic reality is uh, highly divergent from the narrative. That The narrative is not true. It, it's not true today, but people think it is. And that's 
what's important, that's what counts. But when people can no longer uh, pretend, when the reality catches up to the narrative and the narrative changes, then stock market values would change. So, so you might, uh, this, the US stocks will probably go higher, uh, but uh, I would say by late this year, and I'll, I'll use November as, a, as an estimate, it may be the case that the economic reality is caught up to the narrative, the narrative changes and stock markets crash. Um, Bitcoin's uh, uh, a Ponzi, it's not a form of money. Um, it's, it's a pure speculation. If, uh, uh, I, I prefer roulette, but um, if you, if you want to buy some, knock yourself out. But it could, um, you know, it, it, by the way, I wrote about this last month and I said what I'm saying right now, this is not uh, a view formed because Bitcoin had a bad week. It did have a bad week. It was down um, almost 50% from high to low over the past couple of weeks, but uh, but independent of that, I mean, Bitcoin could go back to 100,000 or higher, or it could go down to 10,000. Uh, there's no way of knowing. And that's the point, really. It, it's not a store of value. It's, you can't spend it. It's not money. Um, and it's not a unit of account. It's just, it is what it is. Um, the real danger of Bitcoin is not that the price goes down, it's that it disrupts our linear way of thinking uh, with regard to money in general, that Bitcoin will not replace the US dollar, but it, it may destroy the US dollar by destroying the concept of money to the point where, you know, is it a video game, is it real, or what is money? And uh, once you get into that world, and we're kind of in that world, we just don't realize it. It's, you know, so the old saying, uh, we don't know who discovered water, but we know it was not the fish because the fish is in the water and doesn't know about water until you take it out. We're in the world of Bitcoin um, and everyone spun up about price and blockchain and all that stuff. That's all content, it doesn't really matter very much. Uh, but what does matter is the water, the, the, the electronic environment that we're in, uh, the immersion, the water around the fish, which is destroying the idea of money. And that may have consequences that go way beyond Bitcoin. So, uh, Greg, I'm going to I'm going to stop there. I'm going to toss it back to you, and I uh, look forward to some questions. Jim, uh, look, we've got a number of questions come through, and also I've got a, a few questions to ask. And um, uh, certainly, congratulations on your your presentation. I do love um, how much you know about um, what's going on in Australia, and uh, which is fantastic. Um, Jim, first of all, I know you have a great passion for gold. And uh, of course, you were uh, saying that um, when we last spoke with you, and somebody has asked this question again, is that, you know, you were saying that gold was going to reach um, 15,000 US. Right. Right. And as, right. you, as you know, as we speak, uh, it's about 1,888. So um, do you still believe that it'll go to 15,000? And and how quickly? Um, I, I do believe that. I think the analysis supports that. I'm happy to explain that. There are, uh, and by, by the way, this will take several years. So the horizon for that is maybe 2025, could be sooner, but 2025 is a reasonable estimate. Uh, and I base it on three things. Number one, um, there's no central bank in the world that wants a gold standard today. It's, it's not like there's some secret cabal of central banks. Let's go back to the gold standard. That's not happening. They don't want it. But they may have no choice. Uh, it may be the case that there's a loss of confidence in uh, command money or so-called fiat money, paper money, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, uh, and they have to do something to restore confidence. So it's not a question of do they want it, it's a question of do they have to do it, is it, is it out of necessity? Well, if you do, it begs the question, well, what price would you go back to? What would the US dollar price of gold be if you were going to have a gold standard. And again, I'm not saying they want it. I'm saying they may have to go to it out of necessity because of a more general loss of confidence in, uh, in central bank currencies. Well, you can make two mistakes. Uh, if you're going to have a gold standard, so the, the paper money is convertible into gold, et cetera, if you get the price too low, everyone's going to come buy your gold and you'll be out of gold very quickly. It'll be a repeat of what was happening internationally in 1971. If you get the price too high, you'll have the opposite problem. Everyone will sell your gold and say, give me the money. Uh, and the first where, where the price is too low uh, is, actually, uh, is, is actually inflationary. And the other one where the price is too high is deflationary and they're both bad. So you have to get to the right price, the right um, exchange rate. It's just like any other cross exchange rate between gold and dollars. 
so that it's not inflationary on the one hand, not deflationary on the other. Well, how do you do that? Well, it's a pretty simple math problem. You basically take the gold supply, which in the case of the United States is about 8,100 metric tons, and then you take the money supply, which varies, but uh, we, we can uh, estimate that. By the way, you, you'd have to do this globally. Uh, but you'd have to get you know, Japan and Australia and Canada and, and Europe and uh, other major economies to join you uh, to prevent arbitrage. But basically, the, the numbers are a global uh, M1 is about $30 trillion. It varies. It's, it's growing, but it's about $30 trillion. The global gold supply is about 35,000 metric tons, give or take. So you just do the math. Uh, what is the price per ounce if you have, <coughs> pardon me, if you have $30 trillion of money and 35,000 metric tons of gold, uh, so you have to make one other assumption, which is what ratio of gold to money do you want? Uh, well, the answer, you know, 40% historically has been enough. The Austrians say it's got to be 100% or nothing. That's not true. A 40% backing is pretty strong. That'll, that'll work. So if you have a $30 trillion of M1, 40% of that is $12 trillion. If you need $12 trillion worth of gold and you have 35,000 metric tons, what's the price? Well, it comes out around $15,000 an ounce. So again, that's not some number I pulled out of the air just to attract attention. I mean, uh, you know, I don't need that. Uh, and I wouldn't work that way anyway. It's, it's, a very, it's a very straightforward math problem, but that is the implied non-deflationary price of gold. That is the price that gold would have to be to avoid inflation or deflation on the gold standards. So that's one uh, method. There's another method completely different, which interestingly ends up in the same place, which is um, uh, it's more of a technical method. So we've had two great bull markets in gold starting in 1971. Prior to 1971, you didn't have bull or bear markets in gold because we were on a gold standard. It, it was a fixed price. It didn't go up or down, it was fixed. Yeah, there were adjustments uh, during the Great Depression uh, the dollar was devalued, um, but uh, but you know, and then prior to the 1870s, gold was money. People walked around with eight gram uh, coins. The, the British sovereign was the was the classic. We go all the way back to the Roman Empire earlier. It, it was no question of exchange rates. Gold was money. But beginning with uh, you know, say the 20th century, uh, we've had these various gold standards. They weren't broken completely until 1971. So that's that's the, the where you begin your analysis of bull and bear markets. So the first great bull market was 1971 to 1980. Gold went from $35 an ounce to $800 an ounce. That's a, about a 2,000% increase. Then uh, you had a, a long bear market from 1980 to 1999. Slow, gradual, but just kind of ground its way down. Then beginning in 1999, when gold was $250 an ounce, you had the second great bull market, which lasted for 12 years, from 1999 to 2011, and gold went up almost 700% from $250 an ounce to uh, $1,900 an ounce. Uh, and then you had another bear market from 2011 to 2015. The third great bull market started, we know the exact date, December 16th, 2015. It's when Janet Yellen's liftoff took place, uh, ironically, um, and gold was $1,050 an ounce. Today, it's up over 80%. As you mentioned, it's $1,830 you know, or $40 an ounce. It bounces around a little bit. So in this new bull market, gold is up 80% in the last uh, about four and a half years. Um, but if you look at the two prior bull markets, one was up 2,000%. The other one was up 700%. So if you just took a simple average of the two, you don't have to get crazy and pick the high number, just a simple average of the two, um, that would suggest that on average, this new bull market should take gold up uh, about 1,300%, uh, 1,300%. 1, uh, well, starting with the $1,000 an ounce base, that would get it to $13,000 an ounce. So what's interesting is that if you use the implied non-deflationary non price in a potential gold standard, or if you simply take a technical uh, analysis using the two prior bull markets, you come out you know, somewhere around you know, close to $15,000 an ounce either way. The third thing I would mention, Greg, and this is the part that people just don't understand, it was like, well, gold's, you know, let's just say $2,000 an ounce. It's not there, it's, it's 1830 or so but just take $2,000 an ounce for a round number. And gold was there last summer. 
Well, to go from $2,000 an ounce to $3,000 an ounce, that's a 50% increase. That's a big lift. You, you really got to go up a lot. But to go from $14,000 an ounce to $15,000 an ounce, that's only a 7% increase. In other words, it's the same $1,000. If you have an ounce of gold, you made $1,000 either way and good for you. It's the same $1,000. It's real money. But the percentage increase gets smaller as the absolute value gets larger. So yeah, 2,000 to 3,000 is a long haul, 3,000 to 4,000 is a long haul, that's a 33% increase. But by the time you get to 10,000, it's only a 10% increase to get to 11. Then it's only a 9% increase to get to 12. And 14 to 15 is only a 7% increase. That's almost like one week's volatility. In other words, at the end, you start bang, 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 $1,000 an ounce in, uh, in less than a month or maybe even just a couple of weeks. So it, it starts out slowly, but happens very quickly at the end. So whether you're um, looking at um, you know, central bank monetary policy, uh, historical bull markets, or simple math, uh, you get to $15,000 very easily. So Jim, if I can be correct, you're saying that it will get to 15,000, but you're saying this could be 15 or 20 years away. No, five years or less. Five years or less? Yes. Okay, so in the next five years, you think or you feel it will go to 15,000 US? Yes, I would say 2025. So that's even uh, maybe four years. Okay, all right. But, but the good. point being, it'll happen, it'll happen very quickly at the end. It's not a, it's not a uniform thing. It'll, it'll start to go up $1,000 an ounce every couple of weeks toward the end. So you want to get in now so you can participate in that. Hmm. Uh, Jim, I have another question here. Um, we had um, Robert Kiyosaki as a guest, and um, Robert said on this uh, program, somebody is saying that on the GoCo event 12 months ago, that, that bank shares will drop. Now, since he said that, some of the leading bank shares in Australia has doubled. Who can we believe? This is the well, question. Robert, Robert Kiyosaki is a good friend and a very... Uh, very strong economic analysis. So I, I lean his, his direction, uh, but I'll tell you why specifically. Um, and, you know, Greg, it's really important to sort, sort out, you know, cause I make forecasts all the time and I'll make a forecast. And the next day, you know, the opposite will happen and somebody go, well, you're a dope, you, you know, you did wrong. No, you have to look at short-term, intermediate-term, long-term forecasts. I just gave you a goal forecast, but I, I specified four year, four to five years. Um, I, most of my forecasts are six months, uh, but they're constantly updated. So, uh, but here's, here's the threat to bank shares, uh, not, not just banks, but also um, MasterCard and Visa. They could be completely, completely disintermediated and driven out of business by central bank digital currencies. I mean, what's, what's being envisioned right now is, and the, the Fed is a little behind the curve. China's got a prototype. They're gonna really promote it during the Winter Olympics next year. Um, Europe is working on it. The Fed's working on it. We'll probably have something in the next two years, but it will get to the point where you'll have an account at the Fed and your dollars will be on a smart card or your smartphone. And when you want to pay somebody else, it'll go right through the Fed ledger. You don't need a bank. Why do you need deposit slips and online banking withdrawals and, and, and all, you know, balance? Why do you need all that? You don't need any of that. Why do you need MasterCard and Visa? You can just have a digital dollar account at the Fed. So um, that is extremely, that would take bank shares to zero. Uh, again, that's not going to happen overnight, but that's coming. And investors are usually the last to know. The stock market is supposed to be forward looking. They don't do a very good job. They look forward, but they usually get it wrong. So here's a case where if you don't understand that central bank digital currencies can disintermediate the entire banking system, that's important that you do grasp that because that would be fatal for bank shares, MasterCard, and Visa. Well, this is a big this is a big comment you're making. I love it. This is breaking news. You're saying that the central bank could lead us to uh, Visa, MasterCard. We we won't have one anymore. Go right, on. Because uh, I mean, yeah, Visa, Visa, um, Visa merchant acquirers charge about two and a half percent. Yeah. Um, your bank charges you something may not be a lot, but there, there are a lot of fees. It's slow. It's clunky, but, uh, but we have to have it today because we, we need to pay for things. But if you have central bank digital currencies, uh, 
and the and the central, and by the way, those are not cryptocurrencies. Central bank digital currencies are not cryptocurrencies. It's still going to be an Aussie dollar, or US dollar, or Japanese yen. It's just going to be in digital form. The message traffic is encrypted, but the ledger is run by the central bank. So who needs a bank? All right, this is uh, this is this is big. All right, thank you, Jim. We're going to talk more about that, and when I get you back again, this for sure. Look, uh, somebody is saying here, uh, Jim. Harry Harry Dent is saying that China will lead the bust, will lead the way to the next crash. Do you believe that? Uh, the the world economy. I look, they're all different countries, all different political systems, all different economies. I understand all that. I spend virtually all my uh, uh, waking hours studying it, and I probably dream about it a little bit too. But the point is, so nothing is unlinked from everything else. Uh, but China is heading for a fall. I do agree with that. Uh, I just explained uh, in our in in my main presentation why um, why U.S. stocks are in a bubble. Uh, and so when you're in a bubble, you say, well, okay, what's going to burst the bubble? What's going to change the narrative? What's going to change how people value stocks? Well. Uh, it can change internally just because the facts contradict the narrative and at some point it becomes impossible to ignore. But there can also be an exogenous shock. So could you have a shock where a crash in China leads to a crash in the United States? Yes, that's very possible. And China is, is, is um, they have not successfully generated consumer economy. They're dependent on exports. Uh, export markets are moving away. I, I was, to me, the future is in places like Vietnam and India. They're going to be the main beneficiaries of the slowdown in China. U.S. is very rapidly moving its supply chain out of China as fast as we can. You know, uh, Americans like to talk endlessly about the difference between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. OK, there are some differences, but there's one big area where there are no differences. The Biden administration is continuing the China policies of the Trump administration. Biden has not relieved those tariffs. They have not eased up on Chinese investment in the United States. They have not eased up on Chinese students coming to the United States. China is a, is, you know, it's, it's officially, you know, it's, it's atheistic, they have slavery, genocide, atheism, communism, it's like a, a trifecta. Uh, they support their economy with investment over half of which is wasted. And they do that with debt and it's utterly corrupt. So nothing's gonna happen in the next 30 days because they gotta get this anniversary, uh, or 60 days rather, they gotta get this anniversary party over for the, 100th anniversary of the foundation of the Communist Party of China. But um, but after that, later this year into next year, um, at, at a minimum, you'll see a Chinese slowdown. I think that's already baked in the pie. But the question is, does a Chinese slowdown lead to a Chinese crash? And the answer is it might. And if it does, a US crash could be right behind it because the US stock market is equally vulnerable because it's in the bubble. Look, Australia continues to have um a love affair with um, Australia continues to have a love affair uh, with real estate. And the question that's come through here is um, Australian real estate continues to boom. How long will this go on, Jim? Uh, I would say two things. You have to distinguish between residential real estate and commercial real estate. Often they're linked. Often residential and commercial go up together and go down together because it's driven by interest rates, cap rates, uh, business cycles, um, uh, you know, liquidity, and a lot of other factors. That's not true today. Uh, you have a, a disjunction where residential real estate is booming, commercial real estate is suffering. So, so you can't just say real estate, you have to say housing or buildings. And buildings are um, not on the, not, have not hit bottom yet, that's too soon. But residential real estate, absolutely red hot. Um, well, the answer is when, uh, and you've got a very favorable um, outlook. Uh, you know, low interest rates are going to continue to be low. Um, people are moving out of cities into suburbs and into rural areas. Um, we see the same thing in the United States, by the way. I mean, I'm 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 out here in the country. I'm up in the mountains. Uh, try finding a carpenter, a plumber, a painter. You can't uh, even in the cities, uh, which are getting some in migration from places like New York. Um, you want to you know renovate an apartment, let's say. Um, the contractors will say, call me next year, or I'll put you on the waiting list for the end of, you know, we're talking 2022. Um, so yeah, it's booming here too. We see it all around us. But um, there, there are two risks. One is 
uh, do stock markets crash and does that cause a liquidity crisis? So all of a sudden real estate crashes along with it because people are losing their jobs and um, where they're over leveraged uh, and, and that would contribute to that. But the other one um, is, uh, you know, does the economy just slow down? Uh, or another uh, scenario, it could be any one of these, by the way, you don't really have to forecast, you just have to list them and say, you know, use the Bernoulli process and say, well, I don't know which one's going to happen, but what are the odds that one of them happens? Well, that can be a lot higher than the odds of the individual things happening because you've got three or four of them on the list. But the other one's inflation. I'm not forecasting inflation in the short run. I expect disinflation and maybe even some deflation for the remainder of 2021 into 2022. But beyond that, when you get to late 2022 and 2023, yes, inflation could emerge, in which case interest rates are going up, in which case real estate is going down. Hmm. Jim, over the weekend, um, I grabbed this, um, I ripped a, a um, newspaper article out and, uh, and I, I knew I was going to be talking to you. So I'm just going to um, uh, take a question from it. This is coming from, from me in the newspaper here. Uh, the investment legend, Michael Burry, I think that his name. Do you know who Michael Burry is? Yeah, he was, the, um, he was the guy who shorted the real estate market ahead of the uh, mortgage crisis in 2007. He was featured in that uh, um, movie. Uh, I, I forget the, the name. Big short. Yeah, yeah, the Big he, Short. That's right. He was the guy that they used his profile on The Big Short. And, of course, um, it was um, a massive, massive win. Now, he has come out with three new predictions. And uh, this written in this article over the weekend uh, in the, the Barefoot Investor, who you won't know who he is, but he's well known here in Australia. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that he said is that he's good. He, and this has already happened at this point, I guess, um, to, he shorted himself on Tesla when it uh, rocketed up to um, by 743%. Right. I don't know. I don't know if he's still short on Tesla, but that's number one. His second prediction was saying he, he believes that Bitcoin is in a spectacular bubble. And, um, and I don't know if that was said before it dropped by 50% just in the last week. So that we've got to take that into I account. Think, I think it was. He, he said that before the recent 50%. Yeah, so, we, so I think it's already dropped. And yep. thirdly, and he's saying the experiment of printing money is going to lead to hyperinflation and an economic catastrophe worldwide. What are your right. thoughts? Now, of course, he's saying hyperinflation. You're, you're, you're not saying that. Not yet. Um, but uh, again, I hear I would distinguish between 2024 and 2021, but let's just take those numbers. So first of all, uh, he's, two, he's two for two. I mean, he uh, Tesla did drop and Bitcoin did burst. Now. It doesn't mean Bitcoin won't come back. It probably will. Um, and Tesla's in a, in a world of its own. It's, uh, Elon Musk is the greatest showman promoter since P.T. Barnum. But those two things were actually related because Elon Musk came out and he said two things. He said, number one, Tesla is buying Bitcoin. It bought like, I forget the exact number, but it might have been upwards of a billion dollars equivalent of Bitcoin. Number two, he said... Um, that uh, you could buy a Tesla with Bitcoin, that they had made arrangements and if you wanted to pay for it Bitcoin, that was fine. Well, that was, you know, I talked a little bit about when I was talking about the stock market in my keynote, I was talking about narratives. Well, that narrative dominated the Bitcoin world. I mean, you just look at, look at a, a Bitcoin price chart, right? And then look at marketplaces where Elon Musk made those statements. It went right up from there. Now, here's the point. What Musk missed is that if you link Tesla to Bitcoin, all of a sudden your stock price doesn't have anything to do with promoting electronic vehicles anymore. It has to do with the price of Bitcoin because Bitcoin going down was not only going to affect Elon Musk Bitcoin, it was going to affect the price of the stock. I think, I don't know this for a fact, but my, my estimate would be that somebody tapped him on the shoulder and said, hey, E, do you realize that you've now linked the price of your stock to Bitcoin? And then it comes out, it was literally just a matter of a few weeks and says, you know what? Time out. We're not taking Bitcoin for Tesla. We, you can't buy Tesla with Bitcoin. And he said, we're not dumping it, but we're not buying anymore. And then the price of Bitcoin started to crash immediately. And of course, that took the price of Tesla down. And Michael Burry made a lot of money. But, um, but I, think, I think Musk failed to understand. But the, he, he had a stock that was volatile enough. He was a very good promoter. 
Um, every time I see a Tesla driver, you know, in, the, in an expensive neighborhood, I see a Tesla, I want to pull the guy over and get my $7,000 back because we have a $7,000 per vehicle credit in the United States, but I pay taxes to give the other guy a $7,000 credit on this Tesla. So I want my money back. But uh, but that aside, uh, um, it, it uh, so he's a great promoter. I'll give him credit. Whenever you can get the government to subsidize your business, it's pretty much of a sure winner. Good for him. But he, I think, inadvertently and mistakenly linked the stock price to, to Bitcoin. So so not only did Barry get it right, but it was a twofer because when when Bitcoin went down, Tesla went down with it, and he made money on both positions. Now um, coming to uh, printing money. Uh, again, I'll repeat what I said in the keynote. Money printing by itself has nothing to do with inflation. Money printing does not cause inflation. What causes inflation is velocity, the turnover of money. So let's talk about velocity. Velocity is behavioral. It's psychological. It's something the central bank can't control. And it runs on a narrative. Um, and so right now, the, the, there is no, there are inflationary expectations, but there's not actually any inflation. It's just not showing up in the data. Uh, people are saving. Savings rates are sky high. Save, savings rates, uh, and this is slowing the economy down because if I make a dollar, I can spend it or save it, right? Well, the savings rates uh, for 20 years have been averaging between 5 and uh, 8% uh, with a central tendency around 7%. In the uh, second quarter of 2020, they went up to 33%. Even as late as last summer, the savings rate was um, over 20%. Then it came down to 13% last November. And I looked at it and I said, well, interesting. It went up to 33%. Was chugging up, and then it came down to 13%. Does that mean it's going to drop back down into that central tendency of around 7 No, it actually went back up. It's back up over 20 So these are historically sky high savings rates in the United States. But that means people are not spending the money. There's very good data that shows, you know, these government handout checks, every American, they got $600 at the end of last year, they got $1,400 the first week of March. Uh, and everyone said, this is gonna stimulate the economy. No, the data is very clear. The data shows that 75% of the government handouts are either being saved or used to pay down debt, which economically is the same thing. When I paid on debt, that's not new consumption. I'm just paying off the consumption that already happened, you know, last year or the year before. So it's all going into savings and, and debt reduction, which is a form of deleveraging. So there's no inflation on the horizon. So here's the question for Michael Barry, and here's the question for monetary economics. The money's there. It's like dry wood, but you need a match. The match is velocity, which is a change in psychology. What's going to cause that? Um, now here, just to tie it all up with a bow, going back to what I said about um, in the keynote about how Bitcoin will not replace the dollar, but it may destroy the idea of money. And, you know, in 1917, uh, French artist Marcel Duchamp was invited to uh, contribute to a, an art exhibit. And he went to a plumbing supply store and bought a men's urinal. And he signed it, Armat 1917, and he put it in a horizontal position in the gallery. And everyone was shocked. No, no, you can't do that. That's not a painting. It's not a sculpture. It's not art. And he was saying to the world, no, art, art is what the artist says it is. He, for, he was the most influential artist of the 20th century because he forever changed the definition of art by saying art is what I say it is. Well, maybe money is what I say it is, or money, what, money is what anybody says it is. And this is the real danger of Bitcoin. Not, I don't care if the price goes to 100,000 or 10,000. I don't own any. I'm not going to buy any. And as I said, if you want something, knock yourself out. That's irrelevant. That's content. It's like it, it, you're missing the bigger picture. The bigger picture is we are immersed in an electronic environment created by Bitcoin, which destroys the notion of money the same way a urinal destroyed the notion of art. And if you do that, you may lose confidence in all forms of money. And then you'll get the hyperinflation. Mm. Jim, I'm going to ask uh, this question. Of course, you, you made a quote on our station, um, on our show, and uh, it was that um, Bitcoin will disappear and go away forever. Right. It will. Still believe? Yeah. Uh, but not for reasons that anyone understands, but I'll explain to the audience why that's true. Um, again, the, the list of uh, uh, objections to Bitcoin is a long list. You know, 
It's harming the environment with CO2 emissions because the electricity needed to generate the mining. It has no use case. You can't spend it. Um, it's not a good store of value. Um, it just has it, it, there's a long list of things that uh, are objections to Bitcoin. They're all irrelevant. I mean, I can recite the list. I helped to research the list, but they're all irrelevant. Talk about the price is irrelevant. Um, uh, you know, blockchain technology has been around since the 1980s. There's nothing new about that. Encryption of the kind they use has been around since the 1970s. There's nothing new about that. There's a lot less there than meets the eye. But um, the, the, the thing with Bitcoin is that, as I just mentioned, it is a, um, an immersive, all-encompassing electronic reality. We're, we're the fish and we're in the water. And we don't know what water is. We don't know what Bitcoin is doing to us. What it's doing to us is, is, is changing our idea of money. So that's the threat. But here's why Bitcoin will go away, because something else will come along in the place that people will just get bored with it. How long? How long? What's this life expectancy? Um, well, you don't know. You don't know exactly, but probably sooner than later. I mean, do we still uh, do we still use the Pony Express? Do we still send? When was the last time you sent a telegram? It's all over. Correct. It'll just get people just get bored with it, or something else will come along, and it'll be obsolete. So, what you'll say that people will still continue to make money. It might race to a hundred thousand. It'll go up and down, and then all of a sudden, it's going to hit the brick wall. Um. It might, it might even be slower than that, but it will, it'll be, it'll end up being like Beanie Babies. Okay, okay, no, I, I get, it. I hear what you're saying. So you're not giving it a, a time frame. It could be, it could be a while, but it's going to eventually stop. Probably not that long. Only the only reason I said that, Greg, is because tech, technological innovation is coming so fast right now. I mean, it's an obvious statement, but it's true that um, you know it's a long time between the, uh, the you know, forty years between the telegraph and the telephone and um, but uh, another 60 years between the telephone and, um, and television, et cetera. But, but things are coming you know, much faster these days. So it'll probably just be obsolete. Okay. Jim, last question. And um, you had been saying that we're heading for the Great Depression. We are going to get hit. I said, I said we're, we're in it. You're saying we're in it. Correct. We're not quite feeling that in Australia at the moment. Uh, that's true. But so, um, you're but you're you're uh, intricately linked to the Chinese economy and the U.S. economy for reasons I explained in the keynote. So even though Australia does quite well, it is the lucky country. And I said, been there many times. Been going to Australia for forty years. Have a lot of friends there. I I understand the Australian case. But you're not immune to uh, a crack up in China. You're not immune to a crack up in the United States. Uh, they're the two largest economies in the world. Japan has its own problems. And so you'll be affected by that, whether you like it or not. I, I hear you. But once again, we, we, we're certainly not feeling any effects of any downturn in this country. And so I, I don't know if I could say, we're, we're, we're in it, but I, I'm, I'm not doubting that the if the share market crashed by what you're saying, 50 or 60%, well, the world will turn upside down. There's no doubt about it. Well, I mean, candidly, Greg, we're not feeling it in the United States either. I mean, just uh, a lot of what I said about Australia in the keynote, I could say about the United States, now, our residential real estate market is booming. Our stock market is at all time highs. I gave you the data to show that these ratios are, some of them are the highest in history or the second highest in history, higher than they were before the stock market crashed in October 1929, and yet we had a 12-year depression. So um, things, can, uh, things can change very quickly. Okay, Jim, well, thank you so much for that. Um, I hope you can come back and be with us again over the next six or 12 months because um, you really are very sharp in this subject and uh, there's a lot happening. And as you said, the world changes quickly because of technology and where we may be in six or 12 months, time could be very, very different. 